بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تبارك وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, Our guests Brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Here in the center, Islamic Culture Center We welcome you all We are very happy to have this gathering tonight and uh, we hope that we uh, be able to entertain you in uh, so many ways to listen to the lecture to participate in questions and uh, to have that atmosphere brotherly atmosphere i know that you are so keen not to listen to me to listen to our speaker so I will not keep, keep you away from him. Uh, we will start our meeting by asking our chief imam in the center, Sheikh Jamal, uh, to do all uh, what is required from him to introduce our speaker. I know that you may know him better than us, but whatever may be, we have to know something about him for those who are not uh, fully uh, informed about him. Uh, we will start uh, our meeting, of course, as usual, or as it is the Sunnah of Islam, by recitation from the Holy Quran. And uh, our reciter tonight is Sheikh Ahmed Amr. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشون ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله Oh, <laughs> 
Brothers and sisters in Islam, as my colleague Sheikh Zahran said before, we welcome you all at this Islamic Cultural Center. We are glad to have that gathering, to have the honored speaker amongst us, to have also Dr. Clark also amongst us. <coughs> As a chairman of this meeting, I have a few words to say. Our brother Ahmed Didat, he is very hard worker, man for Islam. He is, of course, from South Africa, and he had done a great deal over there. He has a lot of publication. He also produced many uh, 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 video cassettes and he has done for the propagation of Islam more than any, anybody else has done. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely to reward him for that and to enable all of us to benefit of what he is going to say to us. And I'm not going to hold you anymore, but what remains is just how we are going to conduct our evening. Brother Didat will speak and naturally there will be question time after that. But although Brother Didat look young, much younger than I am, I should imagine one and a half hour exercise is quite more than sufficient. So if our, uh, if our Brother Didat is going to speak any length he wishes, but we hope the exercise will end, say, by now it's quarter to seven. Let us say we are going to end, inshallah, by quarter past eight. Thank you very much. And our brother did that. Allah Rabbi Shrihli Sodri Wayasirli Amri Wahlul Ukta Tamilisani Yafkahu Kauli. Auzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
إن كل من في السماوات والأرض إلا آت الرحمن أبدا صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman, our distinguished visitor, Dr. Floyd E. Clark from America, and my dear brothers and sisters, the subject, the topic, as described by the chairman, is quite a stupendous task that has been given to me this evening. I am a student of comparative religion, but the topic is of a higher intellectual nature than that fits into my capacity. However, the Muslims, we have one good fortune, and that is that whatever is required of us is given to us in the Kalamullah, the Book of Allah, in such succinct form that it's hard for philosophers and critics and intellectuals to imagine. Like one Urdu poet, he put it so beautifully, Jo falsafiyon se khulna saka aur nuktavaron se hal na hua wo Raz ek kamli wale ne batla diya chand isharo mein Meaning that what the philosophers couldn't unravel and these critics, higher intellectuals couldn't find the depth this mental clad person, the simple man in Arabia he revealed the secrets in few words Of course those words were not his words They were the words of Allah Bari Ta'ala himself and in the Holy Quran, in the verse that I read to you, that secret is given. What is the relationship between man and God in Islam? I read to you a verse, a very short verse. And that verse occurs in Surah Maryam. Surah Maryam. Verse number 93. In kullu man fis samawati wal ardi. Illa atir rahmani abda. That none in the heavens and the earth will come before his creator except as an abd, as a servant, as a slave. Our relationship with our maker is that of a master and a servant, of the owner and his slave. This is the relationship in a nutshell. And we leave it to the philosophers and the intellectuals to go on rambling about all the other details, but in a nutshell, this is it. He is our maker and we are his slave. Now, there is a difference. You see, this question as the reason for the subject that has been given. Because I was amazed at the title of the subject. When I, just last week, for the first time I saw it on paper, this is what I'm expected to speak here. I was amazed because I had sent some 20 different topics. 20 different topics from which to select, you know, to make things easy for me to speak. And I find a subject which in my life I have never dealt with before. <laughs> so I was wondering whether they were trying to catch me out or do what. This was what the Jews were doing to Jesus Christ again and again. <laughs> I know, the motives of the Jews and that of our brethren is not the same, as, he, as has been explained. See, the Jews were always wanting to catch out Jesus, catch him out. They come to him with a poser, with a riddle. They said, Master, Rabbi, Maulana Sahib Shah, must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? There was a catch there. If he says, yes, pay tribute, they will say, this man is a stooge of the government. He can't be our Messiah, the man we are waiting for. Rejected. If he says don't pay, they won't pay. When the government arrests them, they say, look, our Messiah says so. So he gets into trouble with the government. Either way, he loses. Heads I win, tails you lose. So Jesus Christ, God inspired, is asking the Jews, where is the tribute money? 
this tax money. And they show him a coin. So he said, whose inscription is this? This is Caesar's. He said, well, render him to Caesar. What is Caesar's? What belongs to him? Give it to him. So he gets out of the difficulty. I don't know if it is that easy for me to get out of the difficulty. How? <laughs> now, our Christian brothers, fellow countrymen, we are in an ocean of Christianity, they have certain attitudes about this relationship, about which they boast. Their boast is that they are not like the Muslims. The Muslim says, I'm a slave of God, I'm a servant of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a servant of God and the slave of God. But he says, we, we are his sons. We have a father and son relationship with God. See, that is the boast. On account of that, I think the intellectuals are having it out. Of a chairman, you see, in their on an intellectual level, so they go to these professors in the universities and they have these dialogues or trilogues as has been described. But now I am very, very fortunate in this that because I haven't got that capacity, nobody questions me on that level. The Christians, they don't question me on that level because they question me on the level that I speak. So the difficulties are not that great. Now, this relationship that the Christian boasts about father and son relationship, is it superior to the Islamic concept of a master and servant relationship? Verbally, verbal gymnastics when we carry out, maybe the other one sounds more glamorous. You know, he's our father, the loving father in heaven, and on and on. So, an amazing thing, this beautiful attribute, the father in heaven, it's a lovely attribute for God Almighty. But this attribute is totally ignored, rejected in the Quran. You know, in the Holy Quran, Allah Ta'ala gives us some 99 of his attributes. 99. Crowning with that crowning jewel, Allah. It's like a necklace of pearls. With that crowning jewel, Allah, 99 names, 99 pearls with a big pearl, gem, Allah, giving us a total concept of Allah Bari Ta'ala. And in these 99 names, Father is not one of them. It's an amazing situation. It's a miracle of the Quran. This very simple fact that for 23 years, this man of God consciously or unconsciously kept that word Father out of the book is a miracle in itself. For 23 years, this word is being dangled before him, like a golden carrot. Catch it, catch it, and he doesn't catch it. He is, as Allah describes himself in the Holy Quran, He is Allah, besides whom there is no other God. Al-Malik, the King, Al-Quddus, the Holy One, As-Salam, the source of peace and perfection, and on and on and on, 99 different names, but Abba is not one of them. Instead of Abba, we have Rabb, and Rabb is a far more difficult word than Abba. A-B-B, Abba, in Arabic, in Hebrew means Father, Abba, Abba, Rabb, R-A-B-B, Rabb, Lord, cherisher, sustainer, evolver. Rabb is a harder word, but it's Rabbul Alameen, Rabbul Alameen is Rabbul Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Rabbul Alameen. Rabb, 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 Ab is out. It's a miracle. Because in his environment, from the human point of view, if I challenge anybody, he says, come on, can you in your religion give me some attributes of God? This illiterate man in the desert, he gave us 99. We know it's not his effort, it's not his work. But since the non-believer says, Muhammad wrote the book, it's right. He wrote the book and he gave us 99 name attributes. I would like you to give me half a dozen. Yes, come, try. And try out these intellectuals, these professors, these DDs. Try them out. Come on. Give me attributes of God. So, Almost the very first one will be the Father in heaven. Uh, he's loving, hmm? he's merciful, yes, he's just, he's yes, and on and on, and he can't go beyond a dozen. The greatest intellectual that you will come across, he can't go beyond a dozen. 
I said, this illiterate man in the desert, if you say he did the job, he gave you 99. So he said, well, he was a genius. And a genius can do 10 times better than the ordinary clever guy. Maybe so. But I said, you see, that is not the real miracle. The real miracle is that he kept this one out. The one that is kept out, that makes it a miracle. Because it's there before him. For 23 years, he's being dangled before him. The people are talking about the Father in heaven, the Father in heaven, oh, Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will. Father in heaven. And that word Father is never used for Allah in the Quran. Why? It's a beautiful word. It's a good word. Did Jesus Christ use it? Beautiful. We can't find fault with it. But this word has created certain misconceptions. For that reason, it's kept out. Not because the word is bad. There are so many words which we use in common uh, speech, but for certain reasons, we eschew certain words, like the word comrade. You know what is comrade? A friend, a companion. What's wrong with the word? Beautiful word. But we will not use it. More especially in America, I think <laughs> people are more terrified of the word comrade than here, I think. You know? You people are a bit more broad-minded, the British have. Comrade. What's wrong with the word comrade? Nothing wrong with it. But as soon as you say comrade, in the mind of the hearer, he thinks you are a communist. Association. By association. So by association, the word is contaminated. By itself, the word is beautiful. Comrade. By itself, the word father is beautiful. But by association with other ideas, where in this environment, the Christian is always talking about the Father in heaven, yes. He says, Jesus is son, yes. But they says, you see, this Jesus is not a son like any one of God's creatures. No, no. He is the begotten son. You see, in the catechism, the Anglican catechism, it says, Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. He is the begotten son. Don't make a mistake. Not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. As such, metaphorically, he is the father of everything. He is the creator, cherisher, sustainer, father of everything. But the Christian said, no, 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 not like that. Jesus was begotten, not made. See the association now. So Allah bari ta'ala, he says he does not beget. And they say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. So he says, It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this to say that Allah begot a son. Say so the association now. Jesus is the only begotten son. Allah says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. The other one says, He's begotten, not made. He wants you not to make a mistake, to think that He made Jesus like anybody else by His act of will. No, He begot. So, by association, now that word is contaminated. Therefore, Allah made us to eschew that word. Keep away from using that word. Because there are people in the world. Of course, the philosophers say, he knows it doesn't mean that. I say, I know it doesn't mean that. But there'll be millions who will be misunderstanding this term and expression. So he says, keep away from it. And keep that word out of the book. Is this miracle? One of these little miracles of this book. The Quran. Now, I read this verse to you from Surah Maryam. If you have a Quran at home, I would like you to go and check it out. And it's a very good habit. Whoever talks to you, lectures to you, and if he gives you a reference, make a note of that reference and check it up. Because by checking it up, your knowledge increases, and what you have heard becomes your permanent property. Otherwise, it's a good entertainment. I know we all like to be entertained. We're listening to lectures, we laugh, we joke, and you know, we go away, it's a fantastic lecturer, you know, like this and like that, and it's gone. But if you delve a little deeper into what the man has said, most especially with the references, and when you're checking it up a second time, whatever was said becomes a permanent fixture in your computer. And from there on, you can pass it on, and it becomes firmer and firmer in your mind.
So where will you find it? I said, Surah Maryam. And in the ordinary Quran that we used to read, the Arabic Quran, we call it Masham, Masham, Muslim, Muslim. I know as a child I've been reading through the Arabic Quran, Mushan. And it was very difficult for me, or my people, to find. Somebody says it's Surah Maryam. Where are you going to find Surah Maryam? We might get used to Yasin Sharif, you know. Everybody says somebody is dying, you read Yasin, and again Yasin, blessing. So we know where Yasin is. But the rest of the Quran, generally, the non-Arab Muslim, he can't put his finger on. That was my difficulty, and that's the difficulty of my people. When I tell them Surah Maryam, they can't find it. So, we are at an advantage today, you know, in, more especially in the West, that there is a Quran available. This one here, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. <coughs> Abdullah Yusuf Ali. It's a monumental work. Around the 30s, this man, from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, he had done this job. It took him 40 years to do this job. 40 years of his life he spent. And his language, this English is so beautiful that a lot of English people, when they read it, they can't believe that an Oriental could have done this work. And you do not have to study Shakespeare or Milton to improve your English or your children's English. As consult this book. For English, you know, the language, you don't have to read Shakespeare and Milton to improve it. Read this. This book has another big advantage in that at the end of this volume, there is a very comprehensive index. What do you want to know? Anything you want to know on your fingertips. You want to know about marriage and M, you'll find marriage. 14 different topics under marriage, under that heading. What do you want to know? Divorce and the D, find divorce. Don't just go around and say talaq, talaq, talaq. <laughs> Consult the book. Consult the book, Allah tells you. He revealed a whole surah. For salat, he didn't give us details. He said, look at the prophet. For wudu, he didn't give us details. He said, look at the prophet. For song, he didn't give us details. He said, look at the prophet. Watch him, see him, what he tells you, you do. But for talaq, he wouldn't tell us, look at the prophet. No. Which means he would have to divorce one of our mothers to show us how to divorce. So he goes out of his way to reveal a surah called surah talaq, divorce. But who knows about it? My people, I know. When the wife puts too much salt in the curry, or the samosas are too hot, so he tells his wife, he says, you know, my mother used to make better samosas than these. So he says, why don't you marry your mother? So he says, talaq, talaq, talaq. <laughs> Finish. Yeah, that's, that's my people. I don't know about the Arabs, I don't know how they do it. But I know the Indian Muslims in my country, that's how we do. You get angry, easy way out. Easier than eating peanuts. You have to shell them. This you don't have to shell. Talaq, talaq, talaq. Job is done. I said, look, Allah Bari Tala is giving you. He's taking the trouble. Whole chapter. But nobody seems to have read it. Nobody <coughs> seems to have read it. So I said, open up. And the talaq, divorce, it will tell you how to do the job. You won't regret if you did it the way Allah wants you to do. You won't have to do that thing called halalu. Halalu. I don't know whether you people know what halalu is. My people know it, you see. In South Africa. So, what you want to know? Ah. Uh, Surah Maryam, the brother said Maryam. So under M, you find Maryam in italics. Every time a word occurs in the index in the italics, you know it is the name of a surah. You see Maryam, it says 19. So right, open chapter 19. I said, verse 93, now it's easy to find 93. You see? So easy. Wallah, everything on your fingertips. And this book is readily available. You know, I took the trouble before leaving South Africa. I sent down 2,000 of these. Deluxe editions. Printed in Hong Kong. Wallah, <laughs> printed in Hong Kong. Imported into South Africa and exported to London. <laughs> and in South Africa, I give people money back guarantee. I says, you have 90 days, three months. You keep the book, you read the book, and you return it. Your money will be refunded to you in full, plus one round extra, extra for your trouble. <laughs> That's the type of business I do. And Alhamdulillah, I'm very successful. I don't want to be here. I'm successful. Right. So you see, this ayah in Surah Maryam, it was preceded by those other words, where Allah says, 
وقالوا اتخذ الرحمن ولدا they say that the Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. So Allah reacts. So laqad jiktum shaytan idda. It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. So taqadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu. And the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakpal ardu. And the earth to split asunder. Watan khirru jibalu hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Such a horrible swearing they give you Allah. This is it. Father and son relationship. Such a horrible swearing. That if the heavens had a feeling like you, emotions like you, the heavens would have fallen. And the earth would have split asunder and the mountains fall down in utter way. But nothing happens to the Muslim. Nothing. You know, it's an amazing situation. That Allah Ta'ala reacts in the strongest language that you can imagine. That if you want to swear me, if you want to abuse me, you can't abuse me anything worse than this to say that I begot a son. Allah begot a son because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. I'm asking the Englishman again and again. When I read his catechism, an Anglican, Christian, he said, excuse me, sir, tell me now, when you say beget, begotten son, begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? Will you please explain? What are you really trying to tell me? And believe me, in 40 years, no Englishman worth his salt ever opened his mouth. No Englishman. It had to be an American. It was in a mosque. I was talking to him. I happened to be one of the guides in the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, which is in Durban. I do a job of work, you know, where we have, last year we handled more than 12,000 tourists. And we don't just entertain them, allow them to see the sights. And so this marble came from where? From Spain. And the chandeliers came from uh, Turkey. And the terrazzo work. And the carpet came from Persia. And the stitch came from Burma. Dead, dead, dead things you're talking about. These people that come to our masjids, they want to know you, what you stand for. Not, your, not these dead things. Because perhaps they have better dead things than these in their own home. But this is the usual practice. You go to the Blue Mosque, you go to the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Egypt, where the mosque in Washington, D.C., I've been there, and I see the same procedure. You know, where the marble came from, and the terrazzo came from, and the carpet came from, and the Turkish, the Turks did this, and rubbish, garbage, the Americans is garbage, all garbage. So I do a job of work. And in this, I talk to people, ask them questions, they ask me questions. So it happened to be an American. I was telling him, I said, look, English, that is also mother tongue, English. He's American, but he speaks English. So I said, will you tell me, when you say begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? What are you trying to tell me? He said, it means, I said, what does it mean? He said, it means sired by God. Sired by God. That is the word they use in animal husbandry, you know, from the type of thing they do, you know, uh, artificial insemination and the natural processes. They said, this horse was sired by that one, when that was his father, and he was sired by that one, and sired by that one. It's an animal term, used in animal husbandry. I said, what? But he said, sired by, so what? He said, no, 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 I'm only telling you what it means. I didn't say that that is what happened, you see. This is what it is. It's a beautiful way for you to start with your fellow countrymen. You know, when they talk about Jesus Christ, the only begotten son, we got them not made because God had many sons, but those are metaphorical. See, Adam was created by God. He was not begotten. Jesus was begotten, not made. So you ask him, ask him very nicely. He said, look, we are people from the East. Maybe you are second or third generation English, British, yeah? But most of us, I see, are first generation people coming, and that language also betrays some bit of Pakistan or some bit of Bangladesh and some bit of Hindustan in their tongue when they speak English. It betrays to me, he says, look where you come from, I know where you come from. You see? So, for you it's so nice, so humble in all humility. You said, sir, will you please explain? When you say begotten, not made, what are you trying to tell me? I don't understand. Will you please make it easy for me? And wallah, no Englishman will open, ever open his mouth. That is the best way of teaching him. The fallacy of what he's telling you. Ask him. Simple question, humble question. Please explain to me what is to beget in your language. 
when you say begotten, not made. What are you trying to tell me? Now, this is the main reason why. In Islam, we say you approach Allah as an abd, as a servant, as a slave. And the slave of God is a free man. He is a free man. This idea of father and sonship, we know what it has done to the mentality of people. That familiarity they want to create with God and what that familiarity has done to them. See the example, is there before you. In America you see it. You see it here in Hyde Park. When I was here I saw it on TV. 8,000 gays in London's Hyde Park advertising the way. Last June in San Francisco, not this June, the previous June, 300,000 sodomites, which you call them gays, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. This is the type of attitude you have towards God. You know, he's like a friend to you, like your bosom pal. You know, you can behave anyhow you like with him. That all respect, reverence is gone. So, when you think like that, you behave like that. Then now people generally ask, all these things, you know, how do you get to all these sort of things? Which school, which university, which Darul room you went to? Wallah, I went to no university, I went to no Darul room. How does all these things come about? So let us see, I left school at the age of 16. I passed what is called standard six. And I was working in a country shop, some 25 miles outside Durban, a country shop, shop in the country. And across the valley from where the shop was, was an American mission called Adams Mission Station. It was an American board mission. Amans in Tony on the south coast. At this mission, the missionaries were being trained in comparative religion. In whatever they learned, they practiced on us in the shop. You see, I was a salesman selling sugar and salt, handkerchief, rice, things like that, you know, little, little things. And they, all the other staff were like myself, all school boys, just left school. Cheap labor, cheap labor, you see. So we were there, and these missionaries, they come along, and they knock heads into us. <coughs> the guy comes along, he says, well, he's buying his things, but he says, you know, Muhammad has so many wives. So I said, nothing, I know nothing about that. And really, I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, Muhammad, he copied his book, the Quran, from the Jews and the Christians. I know nothing about that. He says, you know, Islam was spread at the point of the sword. I know nothing about that. The only knowledge I had about Islam, as well as my companions, was that we read the Kalima. If I ever met any one of you then, and you say you are a Muslim, I say, can you read the Kalima? He said, yes. He said, come on, read. So he said, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That's right. Pass. <laughs> That's how I passed and I passed everybody. You read the Kalima, you are Muslim. What that meant, I didn't know. Wallah, I didn't know. I read it. That's a formula, magic formula, I'm a Muslim. I knew the way my father prayed, I prayed, the way he made wudu, I made wudu, the way he fasted, I fasted. I knew all that. But what about Islam? I knew nothing. What should I like to? And this is my people. This is what we were. We knew nothing. We were Muslims before we read the Kalima. So these people are making life miserable for us. They didn't know that they were creating a monster for themselves. That they didn't know. <laughs> if they only knew, they'd regret that they said, why did we touch this guy? Should have left him alone. <laughs> so, still time. Still time. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> so what to do? Leave the job and run away? Or fight back? Now you can't fight back if you have no weapons. And jobs were hard to find. After I was getting six pounds a month, my wages. But I, at the end of the month, I didn't get the wages. I had to work another whole month to get the previous month's wages. That's how bad it was. What to do? So you say, great. What to do? To run away. But there's no way out. But I had a hunger for reading anything, everything, any rubbish you do. Read, read, read. It's a sickness. I had a sickness for reading. So, one Sunday, nothing to do, I go into the boss's warehouse and rummaging through a pile of newspapers, 
I'm looking for some more readily, uh, uh, some nice reading material, like a magazine. We had something like the Farmer's Weekly. We have the Outspan, Personality. I'm looking for anything like that in the pile of newspapers. So I'm going through putting the newspapers one side. If I find something, I put other side. I said, this, I'll take it into my room and read them. And going through. And Allah is Musabib al-Asbab. He is the creator of opportunities. See how he does it. How Lenin found that book. Lenin, Karl Marx, Das Kapital. He was in prison and he read it. And he came out, he implemented it. One man. And today, I mean, 200 million, 1,000 million communists. Because one man read the book. This is what the potentiality of a book. This, I find a book, a worm-eaten book. Red cover, full of mildew. I take it up and start to sneeze. <laughs> the book, it says, is Harul Haq. I-Z-H-A-R-U-L-H-A-Q. Is Harul Haq. It sounds like Muslim. Is Harul Haq. <laughs> I have no knowledge about these things. It's hard to hack. It doesn't sound English, does it? Not to my mind, sir. It is I Z H A R U L. Is Haru H A Q. Is Haru What is this Haru So I see in bracket, in small writing, it says the truth revealed. So I said, maybe that means this. Let's see. So I open the book. And it is a book about the British conquest of India. <laughs> My country, my country. That when the British conquered my country, they realized that at any time anybody that will give them trouble in their country will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was wrenched out of their hands, and once you have tasted power and rule, you want to aspire for it once more. So if we can convert the Muslims, they reasoned, if we teach them to turn the other cheek, we can rule them for a thousand years peacefully. The Hindus were as docile as the cows that they worship at that time. No problem. So they started pouring in the missionaries into India like frogs in the rainy season. Do you have frogs here? In the rainy season? <laughs> we have them. <laughs> like frogs in the rainy season. And they started challenging the Muslims to public debates. At first the Muslims were reluctant. You know, these are our rulers. And if you talk too much, if you argue too hard, they might send us to Kalapani, those black waters in the Andaman Islands. Who wants to go there? So keep out of it. Keep out of trouble. And we have been emasculated too, to quite a long, great extent. The Muslims. You know, even now you find them all over the world. The Muslims. They're spiritless people. Emasculated people. Like castrated people. We're waiting for it to be slaughtered. This is the spirit of the Muslim. Any little thing the Muslim does, the Muslim gets terrified. I took out the pamphlet about the Pope and the Muslim gets terrified. Muslim, not the Christian, the Muslim gets terrified. <laughs> Something has gone wrong with us. However, uh, that militancy has gone out of us. So I said, emasculate the Muslim, teach them to turn the other cheek, problem is solved. So now they come into India challenging the Muslims and the Muslims don't want to debate, so they master our language. So in your language. First, the excuse was that we don't know English. So, right, this is in your language. And this is the beauty, the greatness of the Westerner. Wherever he goes, he learns the language of the natives. Within three months, he masters your language and he speaks to you in your language. The Muslim hasn't got that. He comes from South Africa to Natal, he learns Zulu in three months. He speaks to the Zulu in Zulu. He goes to Indonesia, he learns Indonesian. He goes to Arab countries, he learns Arabic. Wherever he goes, he masters your language. You go into a, somebody foreign country, in 50 years you don't learn his language. And, and I think an Arab saying goes, Man qawmin, amana If you learn the language of a people, you will be able to avoid their vice, save yourself from their machinations. I'm able to do that to a great extent now. See, born in India, born in India as a Britisher over 60 years ago, British subject, I have a British passport when I was nine years old. I know how many of you are Britishers for more than 60 years. I am. <laughs> Not having seen an Englishman in my life, up to the age of nine, I go to South Africa, and now I'm coming to the, the hub of the British metropolis and speak to him in his language and tell him, Mrs. Now come, sir, talk to him, reason with me in his language. And he can't get away with it because I understand his language, what he's talking about. So I can ask him. 
Excuse me, sir, will you please explain what is to be getting in your language? Because I know what it means. I want you to tell me. I want you to open your mouth. So, master our language and challenge the Muslims to public debates. Now, the Muslims have no excuse. The young men tell the elders, they say, look, sir, you know, the Hamari Zaban ke andar hamare saath bahas karne mangta hai. This guy wants to debate with us in our language. How can we say no now? So Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, he was forced to take up the challenge. And there was a reverend founder from England who was taking a lead in that debate expedition. And according to the appointed time and date, the debate starts. And I'm told in the book, I'm reading this in the book, <laughs> that a hundred thousand people gathered at that great meeting. I don't know how voice was carried those days. But somehow the people loved it, they enjoyed it. Even if they didn't hear, they could see you know, what's going on at the distance. <laughs> a hundred thousand people gathered. And the reverend began. Reverend Paul. So he began by requesting the Maulana. He said, Maulana Sahib, respected learned man, please get started. So the Maulana Sahib agrees. He says, you, you are our elder brother. Christianity precedes Islam by 600 years. As such, you are our elder brother. And according to our culture, you have the first choice. Secondly, you are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but a guest at that. So as such, according to our culture, you have the first preference. So the reverend was forced to begin. And he began with a question. This is Maulana Sahib in Urdu. Where is your prophet Muhammad now? Your prophet. Where is he now? So the Maulana thought for a moment, and he said, he is in Jannatul Firdaus with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is in blessed heaven with God Almighty. Out of that answer came the second question. He said, all right, all right. You say he's in, he was in heaven, he's in heaven. Where was he when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala? Where was he then? So again the Maulana thought for a moment and he replied, he was still in Jannatul Firdaus with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in blessed heaven with God. Where was he then? So again, the Maulana responds that he was in Jannatul Firdaus with Allah by Ta'ala. Out, out of that answer came the third question. Out of that answer came the third question. He said, all right, all right. If he was with his Allah in heaven, when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala, butchered at Karbala, then he asked his Allah for help. Then he asked his Allah for help. So there was a long pause. And the Reverend started beating his feet. He said, come on, come on. Didn't he ask his Allah for help? If you have a big brother like this, and if somebody comes bullying me, have I got the right to say, brother, come, please. You know, save me. Didn't he ask Allah for help? So after a long pause, the Maulana says, yes, he did. He said, what did he say? What did Allah say? Because we know he wasn't saved. And there was an inordinate pause. So the priest started beating his feet once more again. Come on, come on. So the Maulana and the people felt the battle is gone. The battle is lost. Maulana ni hamko maradiya. Khalas, this finishes that. <laughs> come on, come on. So the Maulana said, Allah began to cry. So what? Allah cried? He said, yes, Allah cried. He said, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> and the battle was over. You see, it was a matching of the wits. It was a matching of the wits. It has nothing to do with truth or falsehood. See, you try to be clever, you try to catch him out, he catches you out. Catch as catch can. You know that you do in wrestling. This all in wrestling, this catch as catch can. This is intellectual catch as catch can. Catch the other fellow out, he's trying to catch you out. 
But since then, the Christians have evolved different systems. They have, you know, sophisticated. They're more sophisticated now. So they come into this, the verse I quoted you from Surah Maryam. So they have tried to find fault with the Quran. They tried to find fault with the Quran. Previously, they were attacking Islam, the holy prophet of Islam. Attacked him, attacked Islam, attacked the Quran. And they found that they couldn't gather honey with that. So they change the methods. They are master psychologists. They are in the field for at least 300 years. They are doing the job. They know psychology. So they try different, different methods. Now they write books, books by the Orientalists. So they write, it says, Muhammad was a sincere man, but a false prophet. See, he was a sincere man, but a false prophet. They would say that we find no deliberate deception on the part of Muhammad. Muhammad didn't deliberately deceive anybody. But poor man, you know, he was a illiterate. He didn't know what he was doing. So inadvertently, he was deceiving the people. We find no deliberate deception on his part. Now they study the Quran. And they're putting us, taking us to task. They're forcing us to study the Quran. You know that? So from Surah Maryam, we read there, you know, the birth of Jesus after the Annunciation. She goes away to a remote place in the east, and when the child is born, she returns with the babe. As the Quran says in Surah Maryam, I think verse 23, it says, At length, she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. They said, Oh, the Jews, they said, they said Oh, Mary, truly an amazing thing has thou brought. O sister of Harun, ma kana abu kimra sawim wa ma kanat ummu ki baghiya. Says, your father was not a man of evil, nor thy mother a woman and chaste. They are insinuating, insinuating, how is it that you brought this child without a husband? We know you are not married. Alleging that this child is illegitimate. Your father was a good man, your mother was a good woman, and now you bringing this child, being an unmarried girl. What is she to do? She knows that this was no ordinary child. So, as Allah says, Fa'asharat ilayhi, but she pointed to the babe. Ask him. And by miracle, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam spoke according to the Quranic tradition. She said, Qala inni Abdullah. So, most certainly I am the servant of Allah. Ata al kitab. He has given me revelation. Waja'al al nabiya. And he has made me, and so on and so forth. But now, the Christians are reading this. The Quran, they're reading and studying the Quran. And they are posing us questions, problems. See, I was delivering a lecture in Johannesburg. At the end of it, Christian missionary, you know, during the, at question time, he says, you know, Mr. Didat, your prophet Muhammad was illiterate and me. I said, yes. But he said, not only that, he was ignorant. And me, an illiterate person, might be able to lead. God has given him uh, self-knowledge, intelligence, and he can still lead, though he can't read and write. But an ignorant person will mislead people. So your prophet, not only he was an ummi, but he was ignorant. So I'm asking, what are you talking about? What are you referring to? He said, look in the Quran, chapter 19. It says there, Ya Ukhta Haruna, O sister of Harun, who? To Maryam alayhi salam. He said, you see, your prophet didn't know the difference between this Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and that Maryam, the sister of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, and Harun salam, Harun alayhi salam. They had a sister called Maryam. The Westerner calls her Miriam. In Hebrew, it's the same. This Miriam and that Miriam are the same. In Arabic, this Maryam and that Maryam are the same. But for convenience, they call this one Mary, and the other one they read in the word Miriam. See, they anglicize this one, Mary, but it's Miriam, Maryam, same. So it's your prophet didn't know the difference between this Maryam and that Maryam. He's confused. So he says, a man who doesn't know the difference. There's 1,300 years difference between that Maryam and this Maryam. And your prophet didn't know. So poor man, you know, he's misleading the people. He's thinking that this Maryam's father you know, was Harun. Probably she had a father called Harun, or a brother called Harun. He says, no, he's confused. See, now this is a new study they are doing now. <coughs> You have to be prepared now. You have to, and I think, Alhamdulillah, they are actually forcing us to read the Quran. 
Without these people, we are still carry away Khatmul Quran, Khatmul Quran, chanting away, chanting away, without knowing what we are chanting. They are now waking us up. They say, look, this is something wrong here. So now you have to put on your thinking cap. Go to your alims and find out what is all this thing about. Is there any truth in what they are saying? So, you say, what are you going to say? Ask our learned men. They'll tell you, says, no. You see, this is a manner of trying to speak about the seriousness of the seriousness of the matter, that your father was a good man, your mother was a good woman, and you come from such a noble family, the family of Harun Ali Salah. See, because the Imam in the Bani Israel was a family tradition, Hazrat Musa Ali Salam and Harun Ali Salam were Levites, the priestly class, the Imam of the Bani Israel, the Imams. Among such a family is Maryam Ali Salam born. So you come from such a noble ancestry. How is it now that you brought a child without a husband? The Christian says, no, your prophet didn't know the difference. He's not looking to listen. The Muslim will hear this and he accepts it. Yeah, no, I can see the point. I can see the logic, the reasoning. Why Ukhta Harun? Why sister of Harun? But the guy who's looking for trouble, he says, no, 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 your prophet didn't know the difference. So I was confronted with this. And because of the type of reading that I've been doing, dealing with the Christians, talking to them, see, Allah Bari Tala, from his ilm al he tickles you. You know, no Jibreel comes to you anymore. Anybody you come across who tells you he's hearing voices, send him, take him to a psychiatrist. <laughs> I don't hear voices. But you know, Allah Bari Tala in his wisdom, he, he gives it to you. Ilm al is from his own presence. You get it. So I said, you know, the answer to your problem is in your own book. This problem you are creating, the answer is in your own book. I said, where? I said, the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Chapter 1, verse 1. I don't know whether you'll forget. Book 1, chapter 1, verse 1. The answer is there. To your problem about Ukhtar Harun. He said, what does it say? I said, it says, this is the generation of Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus. Ancestry, his genealogy. The son of Abraham, the son of David. Right? He said, right. That's what he said. The son of Abraham, the son of David. So he is Abraham's father, son, and he is David's son. Abraham is his father, David is his father. And then in the book of Luke, this is Joseph the carpenter, who being the son of Joseph. Joseph is his father. In the book of Mark, he said God is his father. A guy who's got four fathers. What do you call him in your language, colloquial language? What do you call him? A man who's got four fathers. What do you call him? I'm asking him, what do you call a guy who's got four fathers? What do you call him? He said, no, 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 he doesn't mean that. <laughs> so what does it mean? He says Abraham is his father, David is his father, Joseph is his father, God is his father, he's got four fathers, Jesus Christ. So no, no, it doesn't mean that. What does it mean? He says, no, no. you see he comes from the prophetic tradition of Abraham and the kingly family of David. He's the supposed son of Joseph the carpenter, but really he's the son of God. I said, you see, and that's what I'm telling you, that Ukhtar Harun does not necessarily mean this is Harun, his son of Abraham doesn't mean son of Abraham, then why should you say the brother of, sister of Harun means sister of Harun? Now this is a different type of knowledge. You agree? And I know, you don't find this in books. This is practical experience things come out. And they have become more and more sophisticated. So, you see, the Christian missionaries, they have evolved new and new systems. We had a Professor Spencer in the University of Durban, West Coast. He was a missionary. But he was the head of the Department of Arabic and uh, Islamic. A missionary, a Christian, Englishman, he was the head of the Department of Islamic Studies and Arabic. And our children went to learn Arabic and Islamic under his tutelage. And he was having side swipes at the students. And the poor students can do nothing. They know nothing. Like what I was some 40 years ago, they are in a similar position. So they come complaining to me. 
So you know the professor said this and the professor says that. I said, look, you know what you do? Get this professor over a cup of tea and call me. This is my job. But for some reason, months went by and years went by, nothing happened. Then we had a Muslim professor coming, Professor Nadwi and a Dr. Nadwi. They took charge of this department. I'm telling them, get this guy for dinner and call me. He is my man. He is my meat. Call me. Hmm? Say, look, that is where I say, call me for things like that. The thing that I know, that I can, you know, sparkle before you. See? I don't have to apologize for anything. That is how Ikram and Muslim you treat me like that. What I know, I say, like, tell us, what have you got? Give it to us, what I have. What I haven't got you asking me, you're embarrassing me. So, it didn't work. And the man retired. <laughs> Professor Spencer came to England. He's an Englishman. After some years he returned to Durban on a holiday. And he comes into the arcade where I have my offices. Next door to me is my ex-secretary. He's got Islamic bookshop. So he goes into the Islamic bookshop you know, to browse around to see what's going on there. So my secretary, ex-secretary, he recognizes the man, Professor Spencer. He says, you know, Mr. Dirac is next door. Would you like to meet him? My secretary knew that we are yearning to meet him. So he said, yes. So my secretary, the ex-secretary, he's got heart trouble. Blood pressure, heart trouble, and he rushes. This man, Spencer, is also an old man, about my age. So he rushes and comes to me, he says, you know, that professor, you know, Abra Gusman, the Averoche, and he says, he understands our language, don't talk our language. He says, but before he could finish, the man is there in the doorway. He says, good morning, professor, good morning, come in, come in, sit down. So he sat down, Professor Spencer, sit down. So what will you have? Something hot or cold? He says, cold will be all right, it is a hot day. He says, get to orange juice. I tell my young man, get to orange juice. So while he's getting the orange juice, he says, there's no time to waste. Time is too precious. So I'm asking the professor point blank. I says, Professor, you know you are a master of Arabic and of Islamic. You were the head of our department. With all that knowledge of yours, how is it that you haven't accepted Islam yet? <laughs> of course, I know our brothers, learners, brothers, they have, you know, more polite, refined, you know, polished ways of dealing with things. I say, my brothers, sis, brothers and sisters, please, you'll have to excuse me. I am a van driver, a lorry driver, a furniture salesman, and from that talking, talking, I have talked myself into this position. Don't expect from me all those nice, nice polished and fluencies and all that. You wait, you'll get some other people coming by with all that, those qualifications. You listen to me. I am myself. So I said, right, why aren't you accepting Islam? Why haven't you accepted Islam yet? You said, this guy is too crude. I said, look, what do you want me to do with him? Play marbles with him? <laughs> so he said, have you got the Arabic translation done in the Arab country of Yusuf Ali? I said, I'm thinking, what's wrong with this fellow? I'm asking him, why haven't you accepted Islam? And he's asking about an Arabic translation of Yusuf Ali done in an Arab country. I said, look, professor, all the Yusuf Ali's translations, whether done in India, Pakistan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Beirut, anywhere, they are all the same page for page. The only difference is, you know, by photostatic process, smaller, big, or finer paper or thicker paper makes it, you know, different in thickness. But otherwise, page for page, every usable translation is the same. So, you know, I want to see one done in the Arab country. I don't know why. So I had one where I was sitting, so I take it down and give it to you. Funny. I am asking him, why haven't you accepted Islam? And he wants this Arabic translation. So I give it to him. And he opens the place. And he gives it to me. He says, read. Actually, he's answering me. He's answering me why he has not accepted Islam yet. But I can't get the joke. I'm a bit slow. <laughs> For a professor, I'm a bit slow. See, I was much like that. Why haven't you? But now he is, you know, his old you know, English way, Polish way, diplomatic way. He says, read this. So subsequently I found out that it was Surah Hijr, I think verse 39. So I read it. It says, Qala Rabbi bima aghwaitani la usayyinanna lahum fil ardi wa la uhwiyanna lahum ajmain. 
So I read that. I read that. And I read the meaning. He says, Shaitan is telling Allah Bari Ta'ala, says, Oh my Lord, since thou has got me in the wrong, now I will mislead all these people, Ibn Adam, take them out of the way, and make evil things fair seeming to them, and mislead the whole Bangalore of them, as is doing to us. That's what I'm going to do. Because you got me in the wrong. So I read that. I said, yeah, so what? He says, you see this word, Aghwaitani? I said, yes. He said, it doesn't mean that thou got me in the wrong. It means you misled me. You have misled me. So if Allah misleads, what can the poor devil do? So he's actually telling me, how can, how can I believe in a God who misleads? But I still don't get the joke. I'm telling you, I'm a bit slow in my thinking. The guy's too clever, he's an ex-professor. So I'm reasoning with him, I said, look, professor, surely there could be two different shades of meaning. One, what you say, and one, this one, what is written here. I said, no, have you got an Arabic dictionary? I said, no, I haven't got it. Even if I had, I couldn't consult it. I said, no, I haven't got it. He said, it means you misled me, Allah misleading shaitan. So I said, you know, professor, look, the simple English word run, are you and run, has got 90 meanings. 90 different meanings. Run, are you and run, 90 meanings. Why not in Arabic, you have two meanings. I'm just simple, my common layman's logic, you see. If run, are you and run, got 90 meanings, and you can't contradict me, then why not in Arabic, this word have two meanings. No, Akhwaitani means Akhwaitani, you misled me. So I said, Professor, look, this is what the devil is saying. And the devil will say devilish things. That's his nature. We always do things like that, don't we? See, I make a mistake and I blame my host. You know, you put me into all this trouble. Actually, I came here with a, with a bag of what you call heroin or something or the other, and I get caught at the customs, and I won't say, you know, I was bringing those drugs in and I got caught. I say, you know, that guy called me and he got me into trouble. <laughs> this is man. This is what man does. So shaitan is doing this devilish thing. He said he made the mistake. He says that Allah got him in the wrong. Allah didn't say. But I says, you know, in your Bible, God says he misleads. In your Bible, God says he misleads. Here shaitan saying if, if it is right, that you misled me. <coughs> That's a devilish thing to insinuate. But that he's a devil. He's talking devilish things. But in your Bible, God says he misleads. He said, where? Right. He played into my hand. That's what I was waiting for. Where? I hope I'm not revealing too many secrets to my professor friend. <laughs> I said, where? He says, where? I said, you see, when God commanded Moses to liberate his people, he tells Moses, go and talk to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. Let my people go. Freedom. But I will harden his heart, says God. I will harden his heart that he will not let go. So I can give him one whack, one plate. So he did it, exactly. He goes to Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. So Allah hardens his heart. He said, no. So Allah gives him one hit, one play. Then he sends Moses again, go again. Tell him, let my people go, but I will harden his heart. So he will not let go. So he can give him another bang, another hit. And nine times he did it. So I said, you see, in your book, God misleads. According to your book. Here, shaitan is insinuating. There, God is saying. So he stood up, but he ran away. He said, Professor, where are you going? Professor, look, I want to arrange a meeting for you in the city hall of Durban. <laughs> He's not listening. He's running. He'll never darken Madrasa again, 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 finish. But you see now, this is my field. Yeah. My knowledge comes from experience. People are making me to, they are forcing me to think, they are making me to do things. Allah, he is Musa people as well. This is how creates opportunities and that is how I get my knowledge. So therefore I can speak on that level. Any other level you want from me? I said, no, you are unfair to me. I must apologize 
that uh, I fall far short of your expectations. Please forgive me. With these words I say, I am very, very grateful for this opportunity and, and for this fantastic audience. May Allah bari ta'ala reward you all and pray for me that maybe I live another couple of years to carry on with this work of Allah bari ta'ala. Wa akuru ta'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil Thank you very much. Right, right. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Ahmed Dad. Uh, uh, I'm first of all, please don't think that when we thought about the subject, we tried to create uh, uh, any problem. This is not. This was not our intention in any way. As I mentioned in my introductory remark, always when we go and speak to people, sometimes we are confronted with such questions. So we thought here there is opportunity to learn from elder brother who is experienced, who is in the field for many, many years. But nonetheless, what we heard, no doubt, it was enlightening, it was uh, delighting also at the same time. If there is anything remain for me to say, and here again, with full frankness and brotherly feeling, I don't mean to be discourteous in any way. But, uh, again, when we go and to talk to people outside, always they try to judge Islam by the behaviors of the Muslims. And we see that as unfair to Islam. And from the same angle, yes, I share my brother Ahmed Didad, the concern of the social diseases prevailing in the West. But it is not the product of Christianity as God has given it. But it is the product of man-made ideology and theories and so on. The other thing I wish to say, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was discussing the question of humanity of Jesus in Surah Al-Ma'idah, alayhi wa ala nabina, after salatu wasalam, in the language of the Quran, man masih ibn Maryam wa ummu, المسيح ابن مريم وامه ما المسيح ابن مريم الا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل وامه صديقه كان ياكلان الطعام Jesus the son of Mary was not but a messenger and his mother was a saint and both of them used to eat and the Quran left the rest for the human understanding because eating it's followed by the charge and so on. So, although uh, 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 blunt language sometimes it has to be done and has to be adopted as electric shock, but on certain occasion again, the Quran tries to, you know, lead us on certain sensitive area to use some sort of. Uh, uh, what Brother Ahmed that rightly said, those intellectual, or those people who call themselves as the intellectual, sometimes they run after words and try to polish things and so on. However, both approach uh, are relevant in certain areas. Both approach are complementary and uh, should be dedicated to the uh, 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 promotion of the Islamic teaching of preaching uh, of the right way to the people, inshallah. Is there any questions before, because we have about 15 minutes to go. Any questions to be raised? Yes, please, may I? Could you kindly introduce yourself? Stand up, please. Could you kindly introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is Stephen. I'm English and I'm a Christian. Uh, and I'd like to <coughs> say that uh, the Bible agrees with what Muhammad was 
saying on one point here that Jesus was not uh, begotten by sex or by any animal act. If you look at the Bible, I'm not a great theologian, I'm just an ordinary Christian, but our point uh, to what the Bible says, this is St. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 1. Mary asks, how can she conceive Jesus since she is a virgin? And how shall this be? She said to the angel, seeing, I know not a man. She has not had sex with a man. And the angel answers, and this is what Christianity teaches, this is the Bible. The angel said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now this is not an animal act, this is the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, overshadowing Mary. All right, this is not an animal act, not a human act, but this is God's act, this is a spiritual act. So we agree with you that Jesus was not physically begotten by some animal act. If you ask an Englishman what begotten means, we don't know, because the word begotten is not modern English. It's not a common word because it doesn't happen every day. Uh, the way Christ was conceived happened only once in all of human history. And the word begotten is simply a word in old uh, religious texts. But if you look at Luke 1, that's what I will see what the Bible says uh, about the conception of Christ. So it was a comment, rather. Was it a question or was it a comment? Well, I was just replying to a... Anyway, if you wish, Brother did that with Lapsalam. I'm very, very happy that Brother Stevens, you know, has been quoting from the Gospel of St. Luke, where this good news was given to Mary by the birth of her Holy Son, and she naturally reasons with the archangel, how can this thing be when I know not a man? Meaning sexually. No, not a man, meaning sexually. Now, in the Holy Quran, this is confirmed almost word for word. When the good news was given to Mary about the birth of a Holy Son, she says, Qalat Rabbi anna li waladun walam yam sashni basha. She says, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? Or the Bible says, When I know not a man. Both meaning sexually. It's only a, a choice of words. But now the reply is to that from the angel, are revealing. You see, in the Bible, as you quoted just now, that the angel said, and the Holy Ghost will come upon thee. I'm quoting King James English. And the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. I know it doesn't mean sexually. But the language is sexual. The language is down to earth. Because the atheists and the agnostic, they have been asking questions. And the Anglican bishops are asking the same questions today. How does the Holy Ghost come on Mary? How did the over Almighty overshadow her? How? Now the Quran says, the answer to that, says, وَإِذَا قَدَا أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونْ Said with that, whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to it, be and it is. He says, God wills it, and the thing comes into being. So we are both trying to say the same thing, but the language of the Bible is such that it leads to other interpretations. And this is, I'm only quoting modern catechism of the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church. They say that Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made. If you say this is not modern English, why in 1985 they have it? Why don't they change it? So. You find it in the Oxford Dictionary, the word begotten. And begotten means what it says. You see, I can call any one young man here. You, you, stand up please. please stand up. You mind if I call you my son? Do you mind it if I call you my son? But depends on what. <laughs> you see? He's on guard. Can't you see he's on guard? You know why he's on guard? Because of that word begotten. He's thinking that I might insinuate that I begot him. <laughs> He's afraid. <laughs> Sit up. Any young man, you Stephen, if I call you my son, I know you won't mind it. 
Uh, if I call you my son. Uh, the Bible says we shouldn't call any man father. Yeah, but I, I'm not calling you father. I'm calling you son. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <that> true. <laughs> you yeah. As old as your grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. You see? I mean, this is human language. Call a young man my son, my son, my child. In the, in the Sulus, you call that, nobody says yeah. it. Nobody. Every, nobody minds it. But if the person who doesn't know that relationship, if I call him my son, beta, in Urdu is a beta, means my son, no Pakistani or Hindustani will ever mind me calling him beta. Or your daughter is a beti, my daughter. You mind it? No. no. But if somebody who doesn't know the relationship is asking me, is it really your son? I says, no, you see, I love this young man. He loves me as a father, like a grandfather, so I call him a son. That's what I meant. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, the meaning changes. That's why this young man was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning changes. He says, yes, mera jana hua beta. When I say he is my begotten son, mera jana hua beta, which means I have something to do with his mother. When I didn't even know, doesn't know what she looked like. Can you see? So, when you say begotten, don't come out with the excuse that it's not modern English, it is in the Oxford Dictionary. If you haven't got one, I'll get one for you, maybe from the library. And I'll show you, it is there today. Begotten means to beget. Begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we are not to attribute such a quality to God, in short. No man, how we philosophize and sophisticate and say men this and men that, the language itself is down to earth. We are both trying to say the same thing, that Jesus was born miraculously. We are going together. The language, we take exception to this. The language you are using, using is down to earth language. For God and our relationship with Him, we must use the sublime language befitting Him and His relationship. You don't talk like you're talking to your, any Tom, Dick and Harry, your friend. See? So the exception that the Muslim takes is to the language that is being used. Uh, any other questions in the meantime? Yes, just uh, uh, your name, can, could you kindly identify yourself? Yeah? Sayyid Ahmed Shah. Right. Yeah. I'd like to come back to the uh, subject of God and the one thing that's important is the is among other qualities of Allah, one is Adam al Rahimi. Is ever so kind? Is ever so benevolent? Is ever so forgiving? Is something that one feels like love. Now, if I were to consider love, then I'm not confused about fear of God, which is the of body or the fear of God. Now, fear does not be inside of God. And all these attributes are loving. How does it describe it? Uh, if you read Yusuf Ali's translation, this translation, I tell you it answers all your problems. You see, I think Surah Ali Imran, Siya Yuhal Lazin Amanu, O you who believe, he says, Fear God as you ought to fear Him. <coughs> Yeah, you're lazy now. Who you believe? Fear Allah as you ought to fear Him. How do you fear Allah? Abdullah Yusuf Ali does it beautifully. He gives us in his commentary three different types of fears or four different types of fears. What is fear? He starts to explain. There is a fear, he says, number one, of a coward. A cowardly fellow. He's afraid of darkness. He's afraid of heights, he's afraid of this, afraid of that, afraid of everything. He said the abject fear of the coward, which anyone should be ashamed of. Everyone should be ashamed of. There is another type of fear, the fear of a reasonable man who wishes to avoid harm to himself or to someone he loves. My brother is driving too fast. So, now the fear of protecting his friends, his family, you know, forces him to slow down. He wants to drive 100 miles an hour. But he's a reasonable man, or he sees the signs there prohibiting him, uh, you know, your, your speed limits. They'll catch you, they'll find you, the barrier line, you cross it, he says you'll be fine. So he's a reasonable man, he's trying to avoid harm to himself or to his family and friends. You know, it's a, a lot, it's a laudable quality, that fear. 
And there is another type of fear, which is akin to love. That you love this object of love so much, that you fear to do anything against the will of the beloved. Like in a crude way, I can tell you about my wife. You see, I love her. You know, she's been my life partner for more than 40 years. And if, had it not been for her, I wouldn't be here. You know, she encouraged me and encouraged me that I left her at home and I'm here for a month, going round and round, all that. But I, I have a certain love for her. And there are things that I will not say to her for fear that it will hurt her. You know, she's so sensitive. My wife, I'm revealing the secret to you. <laughs> so sensitive that if I want to kill her, I don't have to touch her. I don't have to touch her at all. I don't have to give her cyanide. I tell you with words I can kill her. I know her. And I just have to say something every day. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll be dead, I tell you. She'll die. I know that being 40 years being with her, I can kill her like that. And no law in the world can get me. No, no. <laughs> but I fear to do that. I want to have a second wife, and a third wife, and a fourth wife. I'm human. I'm an animal by nature. And I'm, a, I'm polygamous in my mentality. But sh I can't do that. Why? I fear my wife. What? She's going to hurt me? No. She's so frail. If I blow, she'll blow away. <laughs> she's say, I'm big and strong. But no. That fear, as I fear her, is a love. My love for her, I describe it in another word, I say, I fear to hurt her. But that fear is not fear of she, she hurting me or killing me or doing anything to me, nothing. It's that love. That is the fear of God. See, which Suleiman salam says is the beginning of wisdom. The love of God. That you, because you love God so much, that you will not do anything to go against His will. <coughs> like that fear. So there are grades and grades of fear. The first one, everybody should be ashamed of. The second one, a reasonable man, he must take you know, makes you to behave correctly. Fear of what? Getting hurt. Getting your family hurt. That fear is reasonable. And this fear is the bedrock of, of, of the love of God. Thank you. Uh, uh, but Sheikh Zahram proved himself uh, very right when he said he was his only humble man, uh, pretending that he doesn't know. You, you can hear his answer. You can, you, you can listen to his answer now. Yes? You talked about the relationship between God and man being one of the master and servant. Also, in my understanding, the most critical aspect between relationship between God and man or Allah and man is one of love. There is such a position where Allah is free to love man and man is free to love God. If man is a slave of Allah, he has no freedom to exercise his responsibility to love Allah. He is just an automaton. I'm sure everyone here in their hearts need to be loved by God. I need to be loved by God. If I'm a slave by God and cannot allow to do anything, then I cannot exercise my freedom to love God. God, in my understanding, the beauty of the father-son relationship is that there is the son has that freedom to love his father God. And in that position, Allah returns, or God returns as a father. And he cares, he loves, he teaches, he nurtures, he disciplines, he guides, he gives, he proves the lots in that relationship. And all that time there's that security in a father-son relationship that the man is tied to his creator God as a son. So my question to you is, if God is all-powerful, is your belief, why in his power cannot he cannot create a father-son relationship? Because to me, the most important event in the whole of history is, is the fact that man has been reconciled to God. We won't go into how that came about, I'm sure it will be discussed on Saturday. But to me, if you're going to dismiss this father-son relationship, then you are dismissing the most important thing to man to know God. As I said, you see, these are just words, words, words we're using. Whether we use this term or that term, Jesus Christ is spoken of in the scriptures, the servant of God. That servant is an insult to him. He's a servant. So he said, look, we are his servants. If Jesus is a servant, we are his servant. 
servant and master relationship. Why can't you love your master? You know, only as a son. What about the prodigal son? The father and son relationship? The slave can love his father, right. but he does not have the freedom to express that love. Why hasn't he got the freedom? This he God Almighty, look, he's given you the freedom. Adam, <coughs> the first man, was he given the freedom to the freedom of choice? Yes, he was. Right. So he was his servant and slave, his own, owned by the master, and yet he gave him his freedom. He said, look, I'm telling you now, go and enjoy yourself in the garden, eat anything except the fruit in the midst of the garden. You shall not eat, because the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And yet, the man went and ate. Did he have the freedom of choice? He had. So, you have the choice of loving God or denying him. The prodigal son Jesus told you about. He's staying with the father, that means with God. Both the sons, the good and the bad. One chooses to leave the father and go out on his own. Who's the father? God. And the son is given the freedom to move, and he moves. And he makes the choice of coming back. This is the relationship. The relationship is you have the freedom of choice, whether you use the term slave, servant, or son, but because of the sonship business, you are creating another idea, which in the minds of millions of the Hottentots and the Bushmen and the Bantus and the Indians in India, you know, whom you have Christianized in Indonesia. The type of understanding they have is a literal understanding of father and son, that God begot a son. Jesus is the only begotten son. And begotten, I don't know whether you say, is not modern language. You say it's not modern, I said, take it out of the Oxford Dictionary or the Webster Dictionary. It's there. Begotten is an animal act. They said, look, since it's creating mischief, Islam abhors the use of words which have this type of meaning, you know, where you can play with words. Uh, thank you, Brother uh, Didat. Before we conclude our meeting, let me remind you again for the meeting on Sunday. I think this will provide you with ample chance to ask and bombard Mr. Uh, our Brother Didat with many questions as, and, and, and Dr. Clark uh, uh, as, as many as you can. And it is a tradition of our meeting to conclude by reading Surah Al-Asr together. The meaning of Surah Al-Asr for our friends who are not Muslim and who do not understand the meaning, it says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where by the phenomena of time that man is on the course of loss, except that group who have faith in God and follow their faith or confirm their faith by, by good deeds and exhort each other to adhere to patience and to the truth. So let us read Surah Al-Asr all together as a conclusion of our meeting. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wal-Asr Inna al-Insan lafi khus Illa al-Ladheena amanu wa'amilu al-Salihat Wa tawasaw bil-Haq Wa tawasaw bil-Sabr Sadaq Allahu al-Azim Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Nabi Ummi ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says okay. Therefore Jesus was born, he died and he rose again. The second question, if God... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry.